if you don't, so we're going to talk about contact persistence between the patient and many, many, many other databases as we go, kind of go along. So, uh, first little background here. As you can see, we've got quite a bit of things going on. Uh, mainly Oracle databases, working throughout the time since we're in here. One thing that we talked about that's going to be kind of important is the Golden Gate replication, because in many, many ways, Polyglot Persistence is taking advantage of some of the same types of technologies that we were talking about utilizing in Golden Gate and some of the other application technologies. So, as we're kind of going along here, basically, Primarily switched to MongoDB about two and a half years ago, you know, utilizing early online auctions, specialties, all this type of thing. So the big thing, one of the big things, Star Wars The Old Republic, when I worked for Bioware as a studio, kind of went along with, with that. And that was, we had like six weeks to change everything under the sun, including the underlying storage system, the underlying schema, the hardware that we utilize, and some other things. So I've been working for Object Rocket, made the switch over to the NoSQL world. Primarily for you know, the reasons that everyone else did. You kind of see what's going on, see which way the, direct, the direction the market's going, and all the things going. So here's what we're going to talk about today. So basically, what is it? Why do we need it? The data technologies that are available, the impacts of why why this is coming along so bad, so so quickly, and then the three Bs and the cap theorem. The technology we're going to talk a little bit about the specific technologies, and then. The design, because always, always, a lot of people think that when you're talking about NoSQL, it's schemaless. And that, if you think of it like that, you are going to be in deep trouble from the very beginning, because you always need to think about your schema, you always need to think about your design. So then the question about the do's and don'ts more, the connectors, you guys can pretty much read that. And then the final thing, everything is always changing, so we're going to talk about all of those things. So, what is it? Basically, it began from the premier the premise of utilizing the Polyglot program. Basically using the, the correct technology for programming, the correct language for the specific cause that it works best for. Just like you don't use job for everything, you want to utilize the best, the best one. So in terms of the percentage of the market, you've got, you've got Python, you can see the percentages there. It's, Python is still by far, well, by 3%, the largest one that we utilize. JavaScript and its variants after that. C Sharp still hanging in there for a lot of different things at 20%, and then Java 15%. The ones that you don't see on here right now are some of the newer languages that are being utilized, such as Avro by the Apache Foundation that is becoming very big in the streaming world, utilizing by confidence and the other streaming events that are going on. But you want to do the same thing that you do with polyglot programming. You want to utilize the best language, you want to take, avoid all the weaknesses, and you want to use the individual strengths. So we're going to continue on here. Different that takes us the same thing. Different database texts for different use cases, different applications, right? You want to use the right thing, for the right tool. You use the this basically goes back to the NoSQL mantra. Why do you use NoSQL? Because there's a purpose to use NoSQL. The relational databases can't keep up with this technology, and you have to utilize something else. It just can't do it. So, but there are certain other things. We'll talk a little bit about this for later on. The benefits must also outweigh the cost, because you do have costs involved, right? Those are the costs of not only the hardware, but also the personnel, the training, and just having multiple machines and everything else that you have to go along with that. So you want to think about specific questions that you want to ask when you are planning and you getting started. What do you actually need? What does your application actually need to do, right? Does, is this particular language going to work for this particular thing? Is this particular database tech going to work for the individual needs of your overall business and for your specific thing, for your application? And then how big are you? How many people do you have to develop? How many languages, how many database technologies can one or five or 10 or 15 people do? And how can you pay for the support of all that? How much complexity? So what will the, what will the added cost be? So why does all this happen? Why did it all come about? It all comes about because of your explosion of big data. A lot of people call it like log event explosion or event data. Uh, or that's a new term. And basically, it just means the same thing, explosive growth of big data. There's a lot of different numbers and hypes and all this type of thing over there. But the money the money that you have, you've got Facebook, which probably people here know that that's, that number is actually outdated for being growth, 500 terabytes of data. 
the amount of data that's going across the internet as well. It's where is it all coming from? Again, the majority of that is coming from big data, from IoT, from new sources, from new data, just cell phones, internet events, log events, sensor events, just all different types of events. So basically here we went along. And big data, like basically I love big data. It, it excites me, it gets me going, and it really makes me think about where we're going, what we need to do, how the best way to do it is, and basically everything else. It's going to continue to be the driver behind this going forward. The driver, the growth for the internet of everything, that's the new term for it. That'll go away. People will think of a new term in addition to that. But it's going to continue to drive. Everything's going to continue to change. And you and we, we all have to be able to keep up with the change. Because it's just, it's exciting and it's crazy at the same time. So what, what, does, that, what does that take us to next? There we go. 20 billion devices. 6 billion cell phones alone. But 20 billion devices. Every time you see a new commercial for Samsung, what do you see? You see it ordering your milk or your eggs or whatever in the refrigerator for you. Now, I don't know that I want to know, I don't know that I want Samsung to know, hey, I'm going on a trip next week, so I don't need to order a new carton of milk, right? That's a little too intrusive for me, but it's going to keep going up this entire time. Cell phone, smartphones. Think about the smartphone. Think about the change that the iPhone brought about to technology, to our world, to your individual world. What would you do without your smartphone now? Sometimes you may wish that you didn't have it, but you probably wish more that you did have it. It's just ubiquitous. It's more and more and more. So just going back to it, the sheer amount of sensor data, all devices are connected. Everything's an event. Every time you push a button, every time you push a like, every time you open a link, everything is an event. And that has to go somewhere. So the other part of this is there are so many different technologies that you're going to have to utilize. Right now, there are over 160 plus different data technologies that we're talking about that can be utilized. And that's a lot of them, right? There's just, that's the ones that, that were counted as of like last year. So it's gone to even think. If you were to look at it and you say, okay, what am I going to do? Which one am I going to pick? Which direction am I going to go for a career? And then you think about the company. Which technology should I pick for this particular function that I need to log all my events, to turn this into actionable data, right? So it really is, you go back to how well each particular tech works and what you want to look at, right? So here's you go. You end up, you can't use one anymore. We're no longer in the world of, as my colleague calls it, monoglide. It's now polyglot, and that's really what we're talking about. You have to be able to utilize particular ones. So you're still going to have places that are in for party DMSs. They're still useful. But the SQL databases, the NoSQL databases, they all can't handle it. So some of the ones that we support at Object Rocket are the ones kind of on the, eh, except for the top of the Postgres and the Oracle. Rackspace supports those, but directly in us, we're supporting, uh, we'll support soon some of the others. And we've got some additional ones that are coming as well. So this is a really simplistic view of why you need to do things. This e-commerce platform, very fuzzy, but it's there. Your shopping cart, your session data, your boots for your item price, your customer social graph, right? Your Neo graph, Neo for J, your, or your graphs for Neo for J. Your completed orders, transactional, still going to be relational, most likely, right? And then you take that information and throw it into either a legacy or data warehouse, a legacy DB, but you can also use key values. You can use Elastic for fast text searching, for fuzzy text searching. Just so many different things, right? So everything you have to utilize here, it's all there. So this takes you back to how in the world do you keep up with it, right? Because now it's not only the speed, it's the volume, and it's the variety. So many different things that you have to utilize the different technologies. You have to, so velocity is the throughput. Right? It's the sources, it's the breadth of data. And you can kind of see it through there, right? Variety, you have structured, you have unstructured, you have semi-structured. That takes you back to the whole idea, hey, I can go schemeless. No, you can't. Right? Velocity, whether it's batch or whether it's streaming, whether you're just mass inserting all at once or whether you save it up to do batch inserts. And that actually out, that impacts your output, right? It impacts your performance. And that's one of the things that we're always going to be talking about. You want to have the best possible performance that you can have, because otherwise, you might as well go back to the RDBMS world and just do one thing and do it well. So, and then the volume. Just as I mentioned before, 
sheer, sheer, sheer volume. You know, hundreds of terabytes, hundreds of zettabytes, and the amount of information and data that's going through the network alone is just insane, right? So the number of the types, the speed, the throughput, the velocity, right? So then that takes you to the other thing. You have to have some trade-offs. What are these trade-offs going to be? Where are you going to make them? So this is the common, you know, diagram that's out there for capital. Right? You have your availability, you have consistency, and you have efficient tolerance. You want to pick the two, pretty much like it says, the two that are the most important to you. So I don't have to really explain this, it's pretty much there, but you see there consistency, availability, that is where a lot of the audiences fall into. And then your partition tolerance to be able to get rid of the data or put it somewhere or age it out or you know, whatever. That's where right in the middle is where Vaughn would be which we're here to talk about primarily, right, where some of those things go. And as you move back over here too, you get into like the cash reddish and all the different things. So everyone has their opinion on what one works best for them, which tool. So that, that comes, takes it back to the right. The next one, data structure, possible right tools, relational databases. You're still going to have Oracle, MySQL, Postgres. You're still going to need applications and needs that have to have high, high atomic, uh, right, atomic city, right? So you're still gonna need that, transactions, financial transactions, things that actually have to work. So you're, you still have that. Key value stores, you know, Redis, again, caching systems. A lot of people have tried in the past to use MongoDB for everything, just like they use Oracle for everything or whatever before. If you use MongoDB as a caching system, you're most likely eventually going to run into trouble. So remember, try to use the right tool for what you do. Column stores Cassandra. Cassandra actually has a place. Some <laughs> people think that Cassandra and MongoDB are somewhat interchangeable. And to some small extent, they are. However, Cassandra, you have to really think about your schema a lot more in front because it's much more difficult to change once it gets going. It's better to be staying static, right? So document stores, you know, MongoDB, obviously, I have a preference for MongoDB for that. Um, and then draft databases, up to this point, Neo4j kind of stands on its own. Search engines, Elastic and Solar. Solar can be a little faster. Elastic tends to be a little more flexible in its basic working, or in the, the way that you can utilize it, right? It just depends on what it is that you're doing and what your opinion is, because everyone's going to have an opinion. So relational databases, pretty much set. Strong consistency, right? You need your ASCII compliance. You don't know exactly where you're going to be. You do have the schema flexibility because you can always add that column. You can change your index. You can do whatever. But eventually, the indexes and the sheer size of the row, they're not going to be able to keep up in speed wise, right? I mean, even with exadata, massive, max, massive exadata, massive engine, massive compute, massive memory, massive RAM, massive CPU. They can't keep up with certain workloads that we work with today, right? Specifically the logs and the events that we're talking about. So, but it's still out there. It's going to be there. And again, it's for payment systems. And that brings us up to the key value stores, right? <coughs> Basically, your key value stores, your Redis, you know, that type of thing. Operations are based pretty much solely on your key. So, if you don't have a lot of relations, you don't. But going back to relational, obviously, the thing that you're talking about there are the relations, the joins that you have, the indexing capabilities that you have, and that's where you went out over like the current <coughs> stores and other types of things. But key value stores, you know, basic operational stuff, basic product. But when you get to, you take, start taking a look at complex clear queries that you are joined, you're not going to have them. So use cases, session data, user profile, shopping cart. This is where the shopping cart information comes in. Again, sometimes People try to use MongoDB for things that they shouldn't. There was a particular client that utilized MongoDB for their shopping cart. And they wondered why things really, really, really slowed down when they did not limit the size of their cart. Imagine if you had a thousand pairs of shoes in your cart and they never cleared. What would happen? It's if they're no chugging or chugging or chugging or chug. Which brings to another point. When you have too many entities in your array, too many elements in your array. When you get up to 200, it's okay. When you get up to 500, it's okay. When you get up to 2,000 or 3,000, and then you sit there and you say, man, 
this query is just getting slower and slower and slower. And that's why, because it has to keep doing it. There was also a problem with index sizing in, I think it was the 2.4 version, where it kept multiplying. But going back to this, I skipped over, I skipped straight to modules. Sorry about that. So key value storage. Everybody has their own opinion. Get, I get going and there we go. So here we go. Uh, this is where you would use those. It tells you a little bit about them. Very simple, very fast free write. Again, you don't have the indexes. Here's an example of this particular use case. Now we're going to talk about document sources. MongoDB, CouchDB, et etc. So, you know, the flexibility that you have, the JSON schema base, right? You can use it with a lot of different applications, tie it into a lot of different things, right? Um, hierarchical data, the biggest thing is secondary indexes, is more secondary indexes. Now, Again, version 2.4, 2.6, et cetera, there are, there are differences between the ability to support that. They added the ability to utilize secondary index and utilize index intersection in version 2.6. However, there were a lot of problems with the optimizer engine in 2.6, that, especially the earlier versions of 2.6, that made some queries significantly slower than version 2.4. So it wasn't really until like 2.6.5 and above that some of those issues were resolved. So 2.6, you know, 13, et cetera, those are some nice stable versions. But now we're getting into 3.0. So 3.0, 3.0, 13, 3.0, 8, 3.0, had a lot of bugs, specifically you know, a, lot of, a lot of bugs between those, 3.0, 8, 3.0, 9, 3.10, several bugs that caused, quote, unquote, data loss, which you obviously do not want. Um, but there's an example of that particular one. Right? So you want to use these. <coughs> Semi-structured, unstructured, heterogeneous, right? But you still have to do, like I talked about, the joins or very important. Uh, Denormalization requires more space. This goes back to the thing. Some people think this is a big deal. Space is cheap, disk is cheap. However, the more disk, the more data that you have on disk, then the more you have to actually query through, utilize, and in earlier versions, again, 2.4, 2.6, whatever you run into fragmentation. With Wire Tiger Engine, obviously, you start to get rid of some of the fragmentation, but you also introduce a lot of other things. A lot of the other uh, presentations here will talk about Wire Tiger, but a lot of the bugs, a lot of data loss things, that, and a lot of the, the cache memory settings that you'll have to change in order to, basically on the computer now, that you'll have to change in order to cache eviction things that you have to fix. So, but good use cases, product catalog, right, TMSs, uh, Adobe, if you can ever get it to work correctly with Adobe, that's a good thing. Event logging coming from a bunch of different courses. Now, a lot of companies have tried to, to effectively implement the Adobe utilizing Mongo. There's all of this thing, but unless you do it specifically packaged the way that Adobe wants it to be done, it can be very problematic. So, enough for the document stores that takes us over to the column stores. So, when do you utilize those? These are the best cases there. Basically, you're looking at like Cassandra. This uh, Cassandra requires more knowledge up front as well. So if you know what you're going to be doing, if you know that your schema, quote unquote, structure is not going to change, and you know that you're going to be very right heavy and utilize more of a pinned only type system, Cassandra is actually faster than MongoDB. So this would, that would be a case where you would probably want to utilize that instead. But if you think that you don't have to spend almost as well, probably more time than a relational database up front, thinking about your schema, you will run into trouble there. But time to data, you're going to lob it in, you're going to lob it off, you're going to keep going. It should basically keep your same structure going forward. So bidding platforms, playlist, you shouldn't be adding a lot of builds to your playlist as you go along. So it should be able to utilize that and be very fast. A lot of companies that do playlists utilize something similar to this on it. So, so and then I did a comparison, compare and contrast slide between those, right? Versus the two. So better with schema fluid changing, heavy read loads, which is a bigger thing. If you have a mixed read load or heavy read, then you're going to utilize MongoDB as a better choice. But heavy write loads, faster, more append only, column store, you're most likely going to be going better with that. So more stable structures, you can need for speed, you can last the sun. 
then graph data makes it six degrees of separation. So I, that's how I just like to think about it. Anytime you have likes, or this person likes that person, knows this person, et cetera, et cetera, the whole Kevin Bacon thing. Um, your data has is highly interconnected, and off you go. You have relationships that you know about that you need, you're going along, right? Uh, social media, there we go, friends and friends, everything that it says right there. So graph databases, as I said, Neo4j is pretty much the one that's out there for you. So now we're getting to the bigger things, the things that you actually think about when you're architecting the system, or when you're deciding which one to pick. A lot of these things are going to be the same questions you talk about when you're picking Sharp for MongoDB, right? Is your data structured or unstructured? How is it connected? Is it likes or not likes? How big is the data now? How big is the data going to go? Go. Do you know what your structure will be? Will it be? Will it stay this way? Okay. Um, How is it going to be utilized? How is it going to be accessed? Is it read heavy? Is it write heavy? Is it 60/40? Is it 50/50? Is it 70/30? If it's 70% write and 30% read, just like when you're picking shard key again, you, you make your choice and you take a look at that. Your access pattern does it change? Are you going to read it? So are you going to be doing batches? That's reading, massive reports. Are you going to be, be doing aggregations? So the same type of thing that you're talking about there. And then again, more questions that you're going to ask. Do you need full DR? If you do, you need full DR from here to there and you're heavy right, and you do an append-only type system, then again, Cassandra might be a better way to go because it has a slightly better um, data center to data center replication than MongoDB currently does. I'm hoping that that's one of the things that's going to change with some of the, the engines that are coming out there now, specifically maybe MongoLocks, et cetera. So, security or encryption. Are you doing encryption at rest? Are you doing it just at disk, or are you going to be trying to utilize the long way? Backups. You know, they've already talked about backups this morning and the backups being so much faster and more utilizable in MongoDB. So, and that's a big thing. If you can do your backup significantly faster, and you can also utilize it as a separate stream and query ability, then that would seem like a really good thing for me. So, language support. MongoDB, because it supports JSON and XML, it has all the drivers, it has all the APIs, it has all these different things. And that's also something, when you're looking at things like Kafka, and Avro, which are easily digestible by many, many different applications. And with, with, with Avro in specific, it's so compact, it can be utilized strictly as like JSON or as a compact binary form that will save you significant space, but it will also save you processing power and speed and efficiency, specifically with long events. So language support, driver really community support, there's a huge one. MongoDB, we have community. We, we talked earlier about community how important it is to work together, to collaborate. And this is very important as certain companies decide they just want to shut down access to certain tools or change APIs or this type of thing. It's the community will be what makes the difference. So that means us, that means everybody here in this room and everybody that attended you know, the last two days for MongoDB. It's just super important to continue to collaborate if we want this to do well. Connector availability. There's, there's, there are connectors currently out here uh, Object Rocket has a connector, Elastic's Mongo connector. Their, uh, let's see, Apache has a lot of connectors out there. Cloudera has a metric S ton worth of connectors out there. So notice I did not say, see the bad word there. That's pretty good. Uh, monitoring, plugins, right? Mercona has some plugins that are out there, plugins that are, and uh, let's see, New Relic has a plugin. Of course, MongoDB has MMS. They made some changes to that to make it a um, more expensive and a little less friendly, but they did have some impressive stuff the last couple of days uh, in, their, in their presentations. So that was also good. The driver avail availability. Mongo has tons and tons of drivers. I mean, you've got the JSON, you've got your, the Python, your PyMongo, your Mongoose. I mean, I could go on and on and on. I should actually have some of them listed here, but this particular slide format is not exactly so, anyway, going on to the next one. Everything's not all roses, right? Watch out. There should be a dead there, a couple thorns on there, right? Every data technology that you add, you're adding complexity. 
That means you have to make sure that your network connection is great, that you don't have lags and time lapses that will cause problems for consistency any more than you already have. You have your eventual consistency, but if you need sooner consistency, you need to make really sure that your network is capable of handling that. You need, you have more systems to manage. You're now asking your, your DBAs, your ops people, your engineers, your developers to support a lot more languages, a lot more data store text, and everything else. So you require more expertise. That puts a heavier load on your people in general. So you can't just you know, get the, the junior DBA. But the interactions amongst them between, I mentioned the network connectivity, the time issues. You know, where to store which data? You have to make the determination. Again, which store do I use for which part of the application? What's the most important? Upgrades, testing. A lot of people forget about those, right? You have to have the hardware, you have to have the people, you have to have the time to also test all this. He talked about the testing that he did before with Sysbench, right before me. So all of these different things really, really come into to effect. And what does that mean? That means you still need to come in ahead. You still need to think about things. You can't just go in half pop because if you do, you'll end up half. <laughs> anyway, so decide what to use when for what, right? You'll have, if you don't, if you pick the wrong technology, how much time have you wasted implementing that technology in the first place? How much time will you then waste fixing it to put it in the correct technology that needs to be in next? You still have more systems to deploy, you still have more hardware to deploy. Uh, configurations, Chef, Puppet, whatever you're using, all of those nitpicky little kernel parameter settings, whatever else that need to be done for each specific database technology or even language. But I mean, you know, you set the syskernel parameters for Oracle or whatever database on your Linux system for years, you know most of them, and you know where most of them are. The ones that are important for MongoDB would be uh, the read ahead is also is a very important one. So, and that depends too on like the size that you're doing, the type of storage that you're utilizing, and a couple of other factors. So keep all those things in mind. Your connections. Manage your connections. Different drivers handle the connections different ways, the connection pooling. And if you don't watch out, you'll end up with excess connections, which will consume excess memory, which will, depending on which version you're utilizing, if you're using Lizing Wire Tiger, you're also already going to be utilizing more resources. And then on top of that, you don't have your connection pool setting correct, and you're going to go and have some explosions there. And then you'll wonder about your performance. So, more troubleshooting across the different technologies. You have to know people who can read the logs and figure out for the different technologies and the different databases what the different error messages mean and how many of them are just noise that can be annoyed, that can be avoided or ignored. That was what I was looking for. So more people, more training, more time out of the office, lots more work, right? So continuing on with the planning ahead, KISS. Everybody knows what that means, but that's not a curse word. Just keep it simple, stupid, right? So keep it streamlined. Narrow it down, pare it down, make it as lean as possible. Use the things that you can use, but again, use the right technology at the right time for the right purpose. Test and benchmark as much as possible. Sysbench, good, but not always the best. You can utilize Sysbench, but you're also, also going to have to have at least one guinea pig customer who will always push the limits, one of which is sitting right here in this room. So, seek more to prove your use cases. Right? Push the boundaries or your customers will do it for you. And that's not something that you want. So then, oops, I went backwards. Let's go forwards. Connectors I mentioned a minute ago. So we've got the elastic to MongoDB connector. The other community connectors are already also available. And we are polyglot morphing. Again, things are going to change. Things that are the way they are today. Like right now, there's the debate between whether you're going to, for any type of streaming system that you're going to have, or any type of event system, whether you're going to go more, more central, still with the primary data store, or whether you're going to start with the pipeline and then pick and choose as you go along, keeping your central data stream the same without changing it. You'll just pull off the information and data that you need, and in the end, you'll put the full record into your HDFS system. You don't even have to use it, you can just put it into an HDFS file system. 
or whether you will change the data as you go along and input it into the various ones. But remember, think about this. If you change the data as you go along, so you have your data stream and it has all the information, and you got your first consumer, and you pull what you want, and then you put it back into the stream after you've done some kind of aggregation or change to it. Then you get to the next system, and you go, oh, crap, I really needed that piece of data. So now you have to go back to that data store, whatever it is, and pull data from that that you could have left in the stream and utilized and pulled here along the way. So that's the big next biggest debate that you kind of got going. But no matter what, it's going to change tomorrow, right? Just like your storage engines. I stole this slide from the coworkers, but you'll see it again in a minute. So if you've got your Rocks Tech DB, you've got your regular MAP, you know, and you've got Wire Tiger. So MAP, again, not, you know, this particular amount of knowledge is pretty much out there, but if you have a lot of updates, even in 3.2, in 3.0, 3.2, you still need to utilize MAP for frequent updates. And it depends on the size of your updates. Uh, read heavy workloads, data indexes in RAM, faster reads, update heavy workloads, those are still the ones that are going to be best and work for you, right? Wire Tiger, big tree indexing, right? Utilizing big tree indexing. No. Write heavy, random reads, example here, auditing, logging, uh, those type of things, the collection, primary insert, and then of course you've got your LSM, which we heard about pretty heavily already, so I don't need to necessarily talk about that. So that pretty much concludes my fast rapid talking part of this presentation. Any questions?